So Scott, I don't, I don't think people, to, to your point, realize, like, he's probably the seminal entrepreneur of our time. Just to put it and quantify it, you know, I probably raised under $100 million in venture capital, and, you know, I feel somewhat proud. How, how much <laughs> money have you raised in venture capital? Well, just for fair, uh, we're about a two-year-old company. Uh, we've raised about a billion and a half dollars. Um, but what we're doing actually is a very capital-intensive business. So it, it starts to sound pretty ridiculous, but uh, you know, we've built basically an app that gives consumers and drivers a completely new way to get a car. So they basically download the app, they can scan their driver's license, and then they're instantly approved for any car that they can afford. They can have that car based on how long they need or how little, but all of these are pre-owned cars for sale at local dealers. Um, Right now, we're only operating in the U.S., but it is a global strategy because it turns out that the average automobile represents about a third of the average consumer's net worth. So you've got, a, uh, you've got about 1.5 billion used cars on planet Earth carrying about $5 trillion worth of consumer automotive debt, and the big idea is that we're not lending consumers money. We're actually letting them drive our car, but they get to choose the car they want from a local dealer who is actually trying to sell that vehicle, and then when they decide that's the vehicle they want, we digitally purchase that, uh, that vehicle and simultaneously enter into a contract for our user to drive that car. That's amazing. <clears throat> so you really took the automotive industry uh, by storm, raised a lot of money. But I want to go back because we're talking about fundraising here. Yep. So you raised about a billion and a half for FAIR, yep. and it's two years old. It is, yeah. So now I just want to point out to the people in the audience who have two-year-old startups that uh, <laughs> here's what's possible. But let, let's sum up in total. How much have you raised in total for your career? Gosh, uh, you know, I've been in the automotive space for a while. I've raised nearly $3 billion in, in venture capital. Um, this business is going to be far more capital intensive than any of those. We actually, for our two-year going forward plan, need somewhere between 4 and $6 billion additional dollars in capital. So it's a, it, it starts to become ridiculous, but I think... So you know, you'll one be of, at one of, about $8 billion <laughs> when it's all said and done? <laughs> no, not when it's all said and done. Uh, we're talking about refinancing an asset class. Um, it's a um, multi-trillion dollar asset class globally, and because all of the cars in our app come with um, a warranty, standard roadside assistance, and maintenance all included, we also sell auto insurance for collision and liability as well as excess wear and tear. So it represents a single cost of ownership and all the other things that go along with a car are about as big of an addressable market as the car itself. So you've got a $10 trillion TAM, or total addressable market, uh, you know, on a global basis. It, it is sort of a, you know, a big, big uh, category, the biggest category. But I've been in auto for a long time, so I've been uh, you know, trying to reinvent the way that people buy and own their vehicles. I've had two public companies, um, CarsDirect.com. We were the first company to put an upfront price on a car on the web. And then I've also got a company that uh, I founded called TrueCar. And TrueCar was the first business that actually published what everyone else paid for their car. And if you think about what we're doing at FAIR, it's only possible because today we have total transparency around what a retail and wholesale vehicle is worth. With a VIN number and a license plate, we can actually get to within about 2% of the actual market clearing value of a vehicle without a physical inspection. So you can point to that car and that VIN we can do this all with data today, we can actually generate a value that allows us to properly price depreciation. And what we're doing inside of our, our business today really rests on top of that data. And what's happened in the car business over the last decade is that we are now able to see clearly with VIN numbers and with all of the transaction data for registration, tax, and title, exactly what a car is worth. And we're just crunching a massive amount of data. And basically, standardizing the data is step one, Collecting the data, step two, pattern recognition, predictive analytics, and then on top of that, and, and the big buzzword, everybody calls it AI, but AI is basically a machine learning model that gives better predictions and better decisions. And in our case, it all comes down to one thing, being able to value the vehicle, because what we're doing is basically leasing uh, or renting these vehicles. The consumer does not own the vehicle, so they don't have to worry about anything other than paying that single monthly bill. It all happens on the phone. We're actually now, um, we, we operate uh, Uber's flexible ownership program. Uber drivers are just like um, any other consumer. Um, earlier this year, we acquired Uber's exchange leasing business in the U.S. 
which meant that we now have a little over um, 20,000 active customers, 45,000 vehicles in our fleet. So that's the large reason for uh, the capital uh, that, you know, that we need to run the business. But Uber drivers are just like everybody else, but they treat their car like a business. We're getting to the point, though, we can actually provide daily pricing, even though we're not a rental. Um, we can actually uh, allow an Uber driver to have a car for somewhere between $12 and $14 a day. That includes the insurance, the maintenance, the repair, the refueling. It's a single cost of ownership. And that's really the promise of technology, making things easier and also less costly. So if you're getting to the point where you can price a car per day <coughs> because you have all the predictive analytics about yeah. insurance, et cetera, uh, eventually that's going to apply to... Uh, self-driving cars or driverless sure. cars so that you just say, okay, I want to have a car. It's okay, $14 a day. Here it shows up. You know, I, I think that, that, you know, first of all, we love our cars, but, um, you know, we hear a lot about the end of car ownership. And I do think traditional car ownership is dead. I've got a 16-year-old son, and he's just getting started, and he's excited about getting a car. It means independence and freedom. And certainly the American love affair with cars is echoed around the world. You've got, like I said, 1.5 billion used cars on planet Earth carrying $5 trillion in debt. Those cars are going to be bought and sold for decades. And because, because a car um, you know, not only represents a great moment in somebody's life, the problem that we have is this crushing amount of consumer debt. Yeah. Taking a 16-year-old or anybody starting out in life and financially saddling them or burdening them with so much debt that they actually set themselves back is not a financially good idea, especially if they're going to go out and buy a depreciating asset. What really makes what we're doing possible is this radical clarity around what a car is worth because leasing or renting is basically no more than charging you for depreciation. If you can do that accurately, and the reason nobody has done what we're doing is they didn't have that information. But this idea of going out and borrowing a big pile of money is not only intimidating and frustrating and time-consuming for anybody, but the idea of doing it is just a financially bad decision because up and until now, we've had guidebooks. And this idea of owning equity in a depreciating asset is the definition of a bad idea for anybody who's getting started in life. Well, wow. But we can price it. So I want to go back to fundraising for a moment <laughs> yeah. to help the various entrepreneurs in the audience. So you're essentially fundraising for a business to do this. But in many ways, your career <clears throat> has led you to this point because yeah. you built for example, Zag and then True Car, which collected all the data and figured out what the value was. And you've been consummately along this journey learning to fundraise and, and honing your skills. Are there any sort of tips in the fundraising side of the business that you can give to the entrepreneurs in the audience or budding entrepreneurs? You know, it's interesting. Um, the headline numbers are, are, are big, and so everybody sort of hears how much money we've raised or how much money I've raised, and that, I, I typically end up talking to entrepreneurs about that topic. Fundraising starts with small checks, though. It's a flywheel. Um, so believe it or not, even though FAIR is only two years old, my first outside round of financing contained about 50 or 54, actually, actually um, friends and fellow entrepreneurs writing $25,000 to $100,000 checks nothing more. And when we first got started, I had a bunch of partners that had heard about my fundraising and said, we're so excited, we're going to be well-funded. That's not how it works. You actually decide as an entrepreneur, just like anybody, to get up and not go to the kitchen, to get up and go to an office that you rent and then start recruiting people. And you send out your thesis and you tell people about what you're doing and they show interest. But in the beginning, it's really a bet on you as, as the entrepreneur. But astonishingly, Big dollars start with small checks, and that momentum is what, what really is required at the very beginning. We did not start out on day one getting million-dollar checks, and I didn't even want them. So we ended up doing a seed round where it took us about six months, and in the process of fundraising, your business actually emerges. What we're doing today started with a big idea, but how we're doing it today was really refined and honed and iterated in the fundraising process. Fundraising is actually one of the best forcing functions and optimizing functions that an entrepreneur can use. Fundraising is basically a free opportunity to get in front of the smartest people on the planet and talk to them about your idea and have them critique you. And you know what? At the end of the day, they're going to vote with their wallet. They're going to tell you whether they like your idea and they're going to give you feedback. And so for me, the fundraising process is actually running a business. And I do it every day. I am always doing it. We, you know, our core competency has to be about making sure we have the capital to do what we're doing. If you think that going out and borrowing money to buy a car, for example, is a big intimidating process, 
I went out and I'm borrowing money to buy all the cars. So <laughs> we're just changing that, that dynamic entirely. And what we've done is made it ideal for the consumer. You literally download the app, scan your driver's license, you're instantly approved for these cars. The entire transaction happens on your phone because you're not buying the car. You don't have to see prices. You see monthly payments. Everything is translated into that single monthly payment. Once you select the car you want, you link your bank account, and it's over. We're not even a credit business. We're not a lender. We're a payments business. And so this idea that eventually you'll actually be able to get the car on a daily basis, you'll use your iTunes account or you'll use Venmo or whatever it is, and you'll pay for that car daily. So you've said many times that you find no to be motivating. <laughs> and I, I mean, I guess if you're that consummate a fundraiser, you're going to hear no a lot. Well, ex explain that a little bit. Well, there's, there's two kinds of no. Um, usually no means somebody is engaged and they're listening, and so I don't take it as a negative. And if you have a hard time with rejection, being an entrepreneur is really not for you. I actually had an assistant after about a decade, she quit and she said, I have to quit because nobody realizes how much rejection you deal with except for me. I read your email box every day, and every time you come out of your office, all you do is talk about the one email that actually was positive. Um, so it, you, you do have to be willing to sort of continue to be optimistic. Um, optimism is one of the most important qualities of an entrepreneur, but no to me is really an opportunity to have a conversation. A real no in fundraising is, why don't you come back when you show some traction? <laughs> that, I mean, that, that is a hard no. <laughs> I'm sure many people have heard that and they were like, wait, I'll get the traction and come back. You've also talked a lot about shifting the power dynamic. And I'm, uh, you know, that's another interesting thing that a lot of entrepreneurs, especially new entrepreneurs, don't understand. And maybe you could uh, yeah. explain so I, that. I've, I've had 50 incorporations in the last 25, 26 years. Um, I've had 130 financings that have closed. Um, Somewhere along the way, I had to realize that the, this change in power dynamic is absolutely essential to getting there. The first thing you have to do is become fluent in everything related to an investor rights agreement from a legal point of view. So you need to understand liquidation preference, pre-money, post-money, how all of that works, common versus preferred, all of the narratives around how to manage the legal side of that conversation. And then you have to understand all of the financial terms. If you're a young entrepreneur, and one of the things they don't teach enough in business school is actually how to read a balance sheet, a statement of cash flow, an income statement, and know the difference between that and a pro forma. The ability to look at a financial document and know which column and which row to look at instantly is absolutely essential because everybody you're pitching for money definitely knows how to do that. I think the, um, you know, the, the, o the overall... Um, sort of dynamic that uh, I've, I've really come to believe is important is that you, you have to interview your investors. Um, they don't deserve to necessarily be on your cap table. And, you know, the entrepreneur is the most powerful thing in the world. They're the ones who are going to actually come up with a big idea, put everything at risk, and go out and change the world. They need capital. Capital is simply fuel. There is no venture capitalist that actually created a better company they actually require the entrepreneur. And most young entrepreneurs have no concept of how essential they are because they're so hungry for money that they'll almost do anything. And that's true in my, early in my career, I, I you know, really took money on bad terms. Now I'm a, at a different point where I almost start every conversation with, a, with an investor saying, tell me about you. I think about, you know, what am I trying to accomplish in investor conversations? The objective of an initial meeting, for example, is not to get a check. The objective of meeting one is to get meeting two. That's all you have to do. And the objective of meeting two is to get meeting three. That's it. And you want to keep things going forward. And so understanding that it is a flywheel and it is a process and it starts small is absolutely essential. So the first third of every investor meeting should be them talking about them. You're going to learn everything you need to sell them when you understand what their stage and scope is and other types of investments. And the best way to sell somebody something is to get them talking about themselves. They come out of the meeting saying, that guy's brilliant. <laughs> and they've done all the talking. <laughs> and you'll very quickly realize, and, and you know, I, just, I had a conversation with an investor a couple of weeks ago that 
at the end of the conversation, I had told them who we are, what we've built, what's going on at the company, the acquisitions that we've made, and we're raising money at a very high valuation and we're raising a lot of capital. And this is somebody who clearly is used to being a bully with money, using capital as a weapon. And at the end of the conversation, they said, well, we typically don't focus. I said, you know what? I didn't call you. You called us. <laughs> and we don't, I almost start every single meeting with, let me just say, we're in a good position. We don't need capital. We're oversubscribed. We're going to be closing around, but it's now is a good time to get to know us while there's no pressure because we don't need your money. That statement is exactly the key to good dating <laughs> and good fundraising, okay? <laughs> Not the money part, but we don't, <laughs> we don't need you. Changing the power dynamic and realizing that you are the asset, you are the entrepreneur, and understanding that going in, that body English, that changes everything about the investment process because they want you more. And it doesn't matter how early on you are. You can interview an investor, and they should explain why they deserve to be on your cap table. It's not just about the money. And at the end of the day, if you really do understand the lexicon, the language of fundraising, you're going to be able to really control the investor rights and all the liquidation preferences and all the other protections that they're going to negotiate for. Because, it, and this is probably the most important takeaway, the psychology of investing is not greed. It's fear. If you want to get somebody to invest, it's not because they want to get richer. It's because if they don't invest, they're going to miss out. Fear is quite literally in marketing, in life, and in investing, 10 times the motivator that greed is. I was one of the guys behind a company called 1-800-DENTIST. When we ran ads that said, brighten your teeth and whiten your smile, those ads cost literally 15 to 20 times more than the ads where we said, here's the bloody gums, and if you don't go to the dentist every six months, this might happen to you. <laughs> it, it is absolutely a true story that fear is the bigger motivator. But when you are talking to an investor, you have to make sure that part of your narrative at the very beginning is that you set the table and say, this is what's happening, this is my timeline, these are my terms, this is why, they'll, they'll respect you because you understand it, but you are basically giving them a binary choice to engage or miss out. So, last question, <clears throat> you know, for a lot of people here, what, what's, what do you see as the road ahead for, you can take that as a blank question for entrepreneurship or <laughs> sure. take it as a personal question for FAIR or... You know, I think it's a pretty exciting time to be an entrepreneur. There is more technology affecting the way that we live than ever before. And I think that great companies, great entrepreneurs solve real problems. You know, for what we're doing, we think there's an absolute transformation about to happen in how we access mobility. This idea that it can be cheaper, simpler, is all enabled by this smart device in our pockets that is literally everything you need to be a better, more innovative company and problem solver. You know, entrepreneurs are innovators, but at our company, for example, we've got 210 people. They are almost all subject matter experts in the thing that they do, whether it's upstream sourcing of capital, legal and regulatory compliance, dealer and industry relations, or whether it's leasing and loan servicing and operations, or technology and engineers, the full stack. These are people who are bringing their wisdom and experience to the business. But it's almost always the entrepreneur who has to somehow be the systems engineer that puts all of that together and overcomes their infinite wisdom. Because if you allow subject matter experts to decide how you innovate, then you're going to be the sum of their fears. And that's why most companies that are old school companies or incumbents do not innovate. Innovation is really reserved for young, innovative startups and entrepreneurs in particular, but they want to have the peripheral vision. There has never been a better time. The world is currently awash in capital. The ability for us to raise over a billion dollars as a two-year-old company is absolutely ridiculous to me, but it's giving us an opportunity to think differently about the entire asset class and the entire experience. Idealizing the experience of buying and owning a car has not been possible until companies like Tesla or Uber came along and just showed the entire industry, the automotive industry, which is about as entrenched as you get, that you can create value by completely being a disruptor and thinking 
in a new way about the interaction between a consumer and ultimately how they interact with mobility. That gives us permission to go out and reinvent everything. And right now, investors see the value that was created, and so they are lining up to hear more about that. It's, uh, it's not going to just happen in automotive. It's happening in every category. And Banking, everything. Everything. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we're a, we're a fintech company uh, in automotive. Uh, fintech is a very popular thing as well. But life is getting a lot better as an end user, and technology is going to deliver that. But it's not just the technology. It's innovative entrepreneurs leveraging the technology to solve real problems about how we're living. It's, it's pretty fascinating. Um, but I, 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 I do think... If you just look at the entire sort of course of human history, there's never been a better time to be an entrepreneur because capital is what is required to make ideas work. Most businesses die because they don't have proper funding. Most entrepreneurs fail because they don't know how to raise money. You know, there's a uh, sign in California on the way from Los Angeles up to San Francisco, and California is always in a drought of some kind, so everybody's fighting for water. But California has got a lot of farms and this big truck is always parked out on the side of the freeway and it says, food grows where water flows. As a reminder that <laughs> we need water, we're farmers, right? But the same thing is true of young, innovative companies. Companies grow where capital flows and that's why the bets are gonna be taken. What really created the sort of technology revolution of the last 20 years is the amount of value creation that has occurred and the willingness of capital to then go and reinvest and to innovate on the front end, and I think now is going to be a bigger boom than we had with the, the entire sort of web revolution and the computing revolution of the last 10 and 20 years. Awesome. Scott Painter. <laughs> Woo! <laughs>